three, two, one, zero. We have to miss and we have to go on the two thirteen. Um, let me welcome you on behalf of all the staff and Dr. Deborah Barnhart, our CEO, to the Rocket Center. Uh, the community-wide planning committee has been very proud and honored to be participating in a number of events throughout 2019, and this has been one of the highlights of what we've been able to do, to talk and listen and capture oral histories of those who worked on the Apollo program and then uh, also to see take stock where we are. So today we have a panel with this very storied history with a tremendous accomplishment, sort of the boost to everything that gets us to the moon. Uh, we have uh, folks who've, I know Ron's worked in uh, more than one program. So we're very grateful to have today the Apollo Propulsion and Engine Legacy Panel uh, that are here. And we wanna thank those who have been supporting us as always, intuitive, uh, Research is our golden uh, anniversary sponsor here for the 50th anniversary of Apollo. And uh, Logicor is our Pass the Torch sponsors this year. So we thank both of those uh, organizations and companies for supporting us. And uh, WHNT TV is here capturing these legacy panels, as is Rocket City Digital Media. And they have podcasts available of these oral histories at uh, their respective websites, they can give you a link to those podcasts as well. So we're capturing these. When folks ask, what did you do for the 50th anniversary? We want to be able to show those who worked on the program. And many of these programs have dealt with uh, the early inception of the program, the rocket team coming together, the technical challenges, as well as the social and, and uh, system challenges of having 400,000 Americans work on something all across the country. Uh, uh, to get to that goal. So uh, we thank all of those folks as well. We also thank Glenn Raven, who is uh, a, a marketing and uh, manufacturing company in North Carolina. They're uh, helping underwrite the cost of these archives. So we say thank you to Glenn Raven and all of our staff. Rebecca Hitt is here, Dr. Kay Taylor at Education, April Adcock, Heather Thompson. All of those have worked with our staff to coordinate these. And, uh, some are here and some are at the Huntsville Public Library, so please tune in to Huntsville.org for a listing of where they are. If I may, Ron Bledsoe has a tremendous panel today and a wonderful discussion that we're anxious to hear. Ron, please come up and introduce yourself and your panel. I hope that uh, everyone can hear. Uh, Joe, by the way, is vice president out here of uh, Space and Rocket Center. So he's one of our key guys in the Space and Rocket Center. Uh, also, there's a lot of people in the audience that I'm going to recognize later that uh, I didn't realize that were coming, but uh, this is really uh, super. But uh, also uh, some of uh, the German uh, children are here. And so we'll point those people out as I show you. One of the things that we're going to do is uh, we're going to first have Apollo 8 liftoff with a five-minute video. Then we're going to go and recognize several people on the panel and also what we looked like back in the 60s. <laughs> so you will, uh, I hope you'll recognize some of us in that, in that capacity in that manner. Also, we're going to talk about uh, some of the problems that we had in, on the F-1 with combustion instability. And we've got a guy that's, that worked that problem. And uh, we've got people here that was on the panel that worked turbine machinery. Uh, and I'll point out where they come from. we also got Sonny Morea here, who was the F-1 program manager that also went to uh, became the Lunar Program uh, Manager also. And we'll talk, talk about him. We have one of our bosses, Alex McCool, who uh, <coughs> actually headed up several, several uh, directors. He was a director, and you put it on you, go, uh, Google, and you, at 95 years old, you'll say, my gosh, what did this guy do? But anyway. <laughs> 
But anyway, we'll point this out in momentarily, and let's sit down and, uh, and watch this five minute video of Apollo 8. ELS 
South Circuit Breakers, you get a chance here, Chief. Okay, Bob, I got the ELS South Circuit Breakers, and uh, we've seen it all. Ignition, uh, staging, and power. I got you. By the way, the cabin. Anyway, anyway, we just have, you know, that's just one of our starts here at uh, Space and Rocket Center. By the way, as everybody knows that that vehicle is uh, laying down over in the Davidson Center that you can see. In fact, all of the, uh, all the engines that we're going to talk about, uh, these are the people on our particular panel. This is uh, where we were the elite, and I say elite. <laughs> Actually, there were 400,000 people that actually worked on the Apollo vehicle. We were just the ones that right now are in our 80s and in our 90s that are still being able to stand up here and talk. <laughs> a lot of, we have lost a lot of our key people that actually got us to the moon. And um, so anyway, uh, the next chart. This chart was taken uh, in, actually, this was taken in March. This right here is a program manager. This guy here is, the, uh, as I said, was the F1 program manager. Would you believe that this guy here, at, when he was a junior in high school, became a pilot and had his own airplane? And he is actually taken with that plane as a Cessna, I think it was a Cessna, whatever it was, Cessna Sonny. Cessna 210. Cessna 210. And he has had, he's got more, close to 7,000 miles, I mean 7,000 hours in that particular aircraft that, he, that is his. This guy right here uh, is, our, is a lot of our bosses here. And he's sitting back here, and uh, Alex McCool, and Alex actually, in uh, in January, nineteen, in January nineteen sixty, called me. I was working at Aerojet General Corporation, working on the Aerojet engines, and also the proposal for the J two engine, which is on the second and third stage of the Saturn V that you just watched. And uh, he called me and said, you want to come home? Because I'm a native Huntsvillian, one of the few native Huntsvillians here. And I said, well, it's not a bad idea. But I had a German boss that I'll show you in a minute that came with the Von Braun team in the, <coughs> that Rudy Beichel and uh, Rudy said, no, you're not going. Even the day that I left, he said, I can't afford you to leave. And so uh, we were checking out of the house, and he called me and said, hey, you can't leave yet. <laughs> said, uh, I said, Rudy, I'm already, I'm already going to NASA at Marshall. So anyway, uh, anyway, I'll point him out in a minute. Uh, Richard Brown here worked with Sonny. He was a graduate of the University of Tennessee. And uh, he is one of the Sloan Fellowships with Stanford University. Real uh, has contributed a lot to the space program, but at this time, he was on the F-1 program engine. This guy here is Lauren Gross. He's our turbine, turbine machinery guy. And uh, we had problems there, but uh, <coughs> But Lauren actually contributed tremendously to the uh, space, space effort. Um, Dave, Dave Arnett was, Dave was sitting back there, and he actually worked on the heat exchanger and the gas generator. This is a gas generator engine, okay, the F-1 engine. He also went on to be the lunar Chief Engineer, uh, and that's this guy here. Me, I was uh, native. I, a native. I graduated uh, from Vanderbilt University. Went in the Navy. Went in Naval Air. 
uh, damaged a couple of Navy planes, not like Sonny did. <laughs> and those Navy planes, they said, hey, son, we can't afford to tear, tear these uh, jets up. So I ended up in the, out on the Far East on the Seventh Fleet. Uh, Lauren, and then I joined NASA in 1960. Uh, Lynn, Lynn Worland is a graduate of Auburn. He also is a, has his master's from Auburn University and worked with Von Braun on several of the proportion problems that we had. And he will actually point those out to you later on in the presentation. Uh, Bob Richmond, I call him the, you know, if you've ever had an old professor in here, uh, Bob Richmond is sort of reminds me of that old professor at Vanderbilt, and uh, but he had, had a brilliant mind, and he worked the combustion and stability problem with not only our center, but uh, several other centers and in, in uh, around the United States. Uh, Jan Munch is the youngest guy here. Here, he's a test lab guy. And he has several charts as to where the, all of the, um, all the test stands in Marshall, test stands in Sacramento, test stands at uh, Mississippi Test Site. And uh, he, he has a good presentation. Also, Jan will actually point out one of the, uh, in 1906, April 1965, he will start a video, which is a two and a half minute video of the Saturn 1C that actually broke windows over in my house in, in 19, actually, at that time, and Huntsville people thought we were having an earthquake. <laughs> but that was not the case, and so he's got one of that as well as the F1 engine. And he'll show that later on. Next chart. This is a chart just to show you uh, about the F1 engine, what it looks like. Uh, next chart. These, this is Carl Heinberg, Herman Widener, Dr. Von Braun, Jack Stokes, who is part of the panel that actually has headed up this organization for two years. And uh, next chart. Ruby Beichel is a guy who worked for at Aerojet General Corporation and came with the Germans and left of the Germans to go to work for Aerojet in 1953. All right. Carl Heinberg was the head of the test lab, the German that left at Sheptown, and he also became the head of our lab, which is a propulsion vehicle engineering laboratory. He was a tough customer, but he mellowed a lot when he came to our lab, and I was fortunate enough to work directly for him as the uh, F1 project engineer. And uh, Carl one morning at four in the morning called me and said, hey, we got an explosion down in Mississippi. I want you on the plane at six o'clock. Get on the plane at six and uh, with a bunch of other guys. We had two NASA planes. His uh, son is here, right here. <coughs> Stand up, Klaus. And, uh, and we, he worked for NASA, and we're glad for that. But I really enjoyed working for Carl. Okay, the next chart. That's Dr. Morazic. He was the head of our lab, the Prussian and, and uh, Vehicle Engineering Lab. And uh, next chart. Aunt Paul, I got this from uh, his kids are still living here, and Hans Paul was, he, we worked for all of him. Oh, we're, yeah, if you'd stand up, if you would. Hans was the most gentle individual, and when I went to Rocket Island with him back in the 60s, he said, you know, I don't know what pizza is, really is eating. And I said, I said, Hans, I said, 
And this will be great. You'll really love this. And so we took and got in there, and, he, and I started sipping the wine. And back in that day, I took and drank the wine, you know, just like water. And he said, no, 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 no. You don't do that. He said, you drink it very simply. And he was a tremendous boss to many, many of us. And next chart. That's Herman Widener. We called him Mr. Proportion. He was the deputy to actually uh, uh, Dr. Brozick back that day. And he went back to Germany to be a professor in the, in the 70s, mid-70s. All right. J.R. Thompson here <coughs> was, he came to Airjet, I mean, came to Marshall in 1963 from Pratt and Whitney. He also came to our section, which was the engines, and he was a workaholic. J.R. was not only that, became the, the center director, and then also became the deputy director. The guy that elected him and selected him is another Georgia Tech graduate, and that's Jim Long, who actually has came down from uh, Tennessee, urban Tennessee, and is back in the back there. Okay, next chart. This is what we look like back in the 60s. Carlisle Smith and I, in 1966, went to Edwards Air Force Base and qualified, was part of the, at Edwards Air Force Base, we had two F-1 engine stands there, and he and I uh, took our families out there for three months and, uh, and ran all the qualification tests for the finished on the F-1 uh, engine. This guy here was a J-2 engine project engineer. This is Jerry Thompson, who actually we worked for. All of these guys, except uh, Larry Ware, he was out of the program office. Uh, Joe Lombardo, he was a division chief and went on to be the head of the, uh, the solid rocket motor in Utah. Uh, Jack was Mississippi. Uh, Werner, uh, this is Werner Boss, one of the Germans, Keith Chandler, and every one of these guys have passed, except you're looking at it right there, <laughs> back in that day. Okay, next chart. Uh, I think we've covered most of this, and uh, the only thing Mike is going to talk in a minute about propulsion. And we'll show you about that. Next chart. And uh, Bob Richmond here will talk about the F-1 engine. Lynn Whirlin will talk about problems we had on the first, second, and third stage. And, uh, and Sonny Morea will actually talk about how he was selected by Dr. Von Braun to be here. You have to realize that back in the 650s, Actually, there was draft. Many of us were drafted, or we went from Naval ROTC, Army ROTC. Sonny actually became as a lieutenant. He, he worked under General Medeiros and worked for, for Von Braun over in what we call Army Ballistic Missile Agency. And, uh, Richard Brown will actually talk about what kind of environment we had. He's got several charts there that illustrate how many tests the F-1 had, how many tests the J-2 had, and he'll illustrate that later on. And then we'll close with what I think is after this video, you'll say, hey, I think I need to uh, become a member of NASA, and I'll join it in, uh, among the young people. Okay, next chart. Okay, Mac. Mac has a mic back there, and so we'll let Mike let uh, Alex talk about proportion and uh, some of the charts that we'll show. Let's check the first one. What you're looking at up there are the history, back in the way back, way back. It doesn't show the V2, the engine specifically, 
But that is the, really the first supersonic record. Most of you have seen it. You've seen it over in the Davidson Center. But that was Dr. Von Braun's pride and joy. It helped us. It helped us many, many years, the technology they developed for that engine. Now, I got a little primer here. I want to give particularly some of you. Some of you are not close to the rockets. <laughs> I want to tell you a little bit about propulsion. That's what this panel is about, propulsion. But we use a rocket engine to propel the vehicle. We want thrust and we want force, okay? Think about that, because we want to escape Earth's gravity. Now, I'd like to compare a, a rocket, if you will, with your car, very similar. Now, your car you use gasoline, diesel fuel. We have to have propellants, you use different kind of propellants. And I'll discuss some of that in a moment here. Now, the V2 use alcohol, 75% ethyl alcohol. They're going out of the atmosphere. They pioneered the use of liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is still used today as an oxidizer to mix with fuel. There's different fuels that you can use. Okay, so we'll stick with that for a moment. If you can't hear, raise your hand. So I just want to make sure everybody here is back. Good, hands up, good, good, good. So, <laughs> in Saturn first stage, we use uh, kerosene or jet fuel, it's a high grade kerosene as a fuel, an oxidizer, liquid oxygen, okay? We like that performance. The F1 engines use that. Now you'll hear more about some of the problems associated using hydrocarbon engine, which is kerosene and so forth. So we have pumps to take the propellants and force them in a combustion chamber. What we're interested in, same thing in your car, is the heat of combustion. We want those molecules coming out, supersonic, to give us the velocity. I think for a moment, we talk about 17,500 miles to get in Earth orbit. Going to the moon, I gotta have 25,000 miles an hour. Now, we use different kinds of fuels in the different stages. First stage, I mentioned it was kerosene, liquid oxygen oxidized. Second stage and third stage of the Saturn V, they use liquid hydrogen. You say, why liquid hydrogen? Now, what are you interested in your car? Miles per gallon performance. Well, we get about 40% increase in performance. The downside is it's cold, 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 second coldest liquid on the planet, minus 421 degrees, which means we have to have insulation on the tanks and so forth, but it gives us high performance. The shuttle used it, the SLS will use it. So liquid hydrogen is still good. Now I'd like to make this clear. We always talk about rocket science, rocket scientists, you know. It's 99% engineering, nuts, bolts, lock washers, pumps, mechanical system, tanks, okay? So the bottom line is 99% of it is engineering. All right, let's see the next chart. These are the various vehicles that you see. We worked on many years. Redstone was really a modification of the V2. It used alcohol, 75% alcohol. We did uprate the thing. The thrust was 75,000 pounds. Went up to 83,000 pounds for the Explorer satellite and also for Al Shepard's flight. We used a different fuel called Hydine, which was hydrazine based and some other 50-50. Uprated the thrust from 75,000 pounds to 83,000 pounds. It didn't have enough thrust to put him in orbit, but it was going suborbital, and we all knew this. And that didn't happen until later on when John Glenn flew on an Atlas intercontinental ballistic missile much bigger, had the performance. Jupiter C is the one we put up the satellite explorer. And of course, the, the Mercury there was Al Shepard's flight. And then we worked with the Navy on the Jupiter missile, which is an intermediate range ballistic missile called the H1 engine. Next slide. Right, now these are the different engines that we're talking about. There's the H1 on the lower up, up left, in the left corner up there, RL-10, was a Pratt & Whitney liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen engine, 15,000 pound thrust. It was a pioneer. Pratt & Whitney developed this with a lot of help 
from Lewis Research Center on the use of liquid hydrogen. Now, it was very good. We used that on Saturn One and flew with six of those engines, and that was really interesting to get enough performance. The thrust is only 15,000 pounds. The engine's still used today, but it was a pioneer for liquid hydrogen, which we had in the J2 engine, which you see in the lower right down there, and it had 200,000 pounds of thrust. We used the same injector concept. In fact, we got some rocket iron people in this audience, and they never have liked the idea that we, NASA, directed rocket on our contractor to use the concept of a porous face injector. We had that experience from Pratt & Whitney and Lewis Research Center had done a lot of research on it. So that's what the J2 had, and that's what's been used since then on the other vehicles. What else? Another cloud. These, these are the same thing you see in the engines up there with the thrust level and what the, the fuels are. Next one. There, these are all the vehicles that you can see. Now, interesting, on the Saturn I, Von Braun had this idea if we cluster engines, and we use the S3D or the H1 engine, modified, and we clustered eight engines on nine tanks. Now, think about this for a moment. Think about taking, you got eight engines, and you got nine tanks. Five tanks of liquid oxygen. I got to get those propellants into each of those engines and at the right time, the sequence, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, you're talking about a plumber's nightmare? That's what we had doing that. So, but that was the S1 that we flew and then finally went to S1B, which had the J2 as the second stage in it, 200,000 pounds, a lot more thrust. Next one. Is that okay, it, Jan? Uh, uh, Jan will actually take, he's got several charts. Uh, <laughs> In other words, and I've always been amazed that here is a good friend that is 95 years old and still moving like a machine. Wow. Uh, here, no, you don't push anything. Just talk into it. <laughs> I can handle that. All right. And Dan will actually go through the testing, and he also has two uh, videos that he'll show that'll, that'll uh, wake you up. Hopefully. Yeah, Rebecca down here will actually increase the sound so that you can hear those things. So it's, uh, it'll be fantastic. Okay, this right is there, close a, there. a little bit of history. This is the Redstone, Jupiter C, and Mercury Redstone test stands that uh, began our trip into space. Next chart. It, it took a while to find a picture of the old H1 power plant test stand firing. But the only one I could find was black and white, but that's all right. But the H1 and the engines that followed it really, a great deal of, of the effort was spurred on by the German V-2 rocket used in World War II. The uh, propellant combination for it was uh, alcohol and oxygen. Uh, that was the, what was being used for uh, the uh, Redstone engine. And the, the next development was to, was to get to something a little better performing, so we went to uh, LOX and kerosene. Now, kerosene is an interesting story because the V2 used alcohol, and that was a good starting place, but a lot of experimenting was done with different fuels, include the different jet engine fuels, uh, paint thinner, any number of things you could think of that would burn, but it was done by North American who f formed a, a propulsion division. And they ultimately developed what we call RP-1 and got a standard for it from, from the uh, Defense Department. And that was the propellant that 
main propellant that we use for, for most of the boosters. Next chart. The next big item was the Saturn One, and to get a head start on building, the agency used uh, a Jupiter tank and Redstone tanks, and, and one in the center, and then eight around. So they didn't have any additional tooling to have to develop. So that was the beginning for the Saturn family, Saturn One. The engine for it was a derivative of an engine called S3D, which was used on the Thor and Redstone, and it was modified to upgrade it a bit to, to, to put on the Saturn I. They, they, a lot of the hardware looks the same, but it's really different. And that test facility, is the static test tower, which is still here. And the vehicle on the other side is a Jupiter. So it was well used testing. Next chart. Then the agency decided that we needed to learn more about the F1 engine. So to accelerate the schedule, we were planning to build a single engine stand but to get there earlier, we made a modification to the static test tower and ended up being able to test F1 engines. It had some limitations, particularly in duration, but uh, Ron was talking about windows breaking. When we, we used to test in the afternoon, but we found that we had to delay our test till after four o'clock because we kept tearing up the ceiling and everything from the army buildings east of us. So all our tests were at f after four o'clock. Uh, next, we finally got into the uh, F1 stand, which unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, but we, the static test tower ran 75 tests, and the F1 stand, we ran 106 tests. And the F1 stand was real critical when we started solving the problems that occurred on Apollo 6. The, the POGO problem, we, we proved out the, the concept that we were using to solve the POGO problem. We had an engine in the stand that we actually pulsed so that we excited the frequencies that were in, we were interested in. And, and the system itself uh, proved about very easy to implement and it did solve the problem, as Lynn will tell you later. The, uh, the stand also, we, the gimbal system, the action, gimbal actuators and the supply system, the supply system was engine supplied. It was tap off a pump discharge. So the, the, to prove out the capability of, of that system, we ran a lot of gimbal tests. And it, it's amazing to watch that big engine move around like it did, but uh, it was very successful. The, probably the, the, the next big thing that we had to do was when we got the engines for the Saturn V first stage, the first one, uh, we had to replace the injectors. So the, here in center, we, we have a prep unit and they swapped out the injectors and we put them in a the test stand and, and ran the engines to confirm their performance, and then they were installed on the S1C. Uh, next chart. Next door to the old power plant stand was another a new facility put in. 
it was the S-4B battleship test. But there are quite a few tests run there to prove out the vehicle integration systems and, and running uh, several tests that were re required to prove the design. And uh, most of the S-4B tests were at Sacramento and some tests at uh, AEDC. Uh, next chart. Then the, um, the Saturn 1B came around. The engines on the Saturn 1, H1 started off at 150K as the S3D, and when it was upgraded to, the first H1 was 65K, then it was upgraded again to 188K, the next step was 200K, and the last engines were 205K. And this was the first test on the Saturn 1B. Uh, next. And here's Big Mama, the uh, S1C stand. The, um, you can't describe the feeling sitting in a blockhouse looking at a periscope at this thing. You, the floor moves, uh, you move, everything is moving. Yeah. Uh, we had people complaining miles away that uh, they had cracks in the wall, but when they were, some of them were investigated, there were spider webs in the cracks, so you wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, uh, another interesting test we had was all, this whole thing would sound. We developed this horn that we'd blow the horn, and we had microphones located all around the, the uh, immediate area. And atmospheric conditions would cause sound waves to focus. And we had several times had to cancel a test because it would tear up somebody's house. So it, uh, it was a new science. To support that, we had one test where they anchored a, a barrage balloon out to the right of the exhaust plume, and the currents that were being created over a period of time slowly pulled it in until it got into the flame stream, and then it was gone. Uh, next chart. The, uh, after the uh, development test, the S1C testing moved to uh, Stennis. This is the B facility at Stennis. And we, we took the, our original T-Bird development test vehicle down there to run the test on and, and verify the design of their deflector to make sure it could withstand all that heat and falling on it. So we ran two tests there, and then the S1CT came back to Marshall and ran a couple of tests. Uh, next, please. This is the S2. This, the, the S2 was interesting because we were used to seeing exhaust that look was yellow and red, and when the J2 ran, it's steam. And uh, you, you get a lot of water vapor, but there were, this was the S2T firing at MTF, and they didn't have a sound problem, but they, they sure generated a lot of atmospheric conditions around the test site. Uh, next chart. Now, these stands did not... Closer to your mouth did not sh sh create any fire and smoke, thank goodness. These were the dynamic stands where, if you, if you look at the big stand on the, on the right, that one that's behind it a little bit is the old Saturn I dynamic stand. And we had a Saturn, whole Saturn V vehicle in it, and they had these big hydraulic shakers that would 
introduce vibration in the several locations on the vehicles to see how it reacted. It was done for the Saturn I, the 1B, the Saturn V, and ultimately to the shuttle. Uh, next chart. glad to report that all systems are go here at Marshall Space Flight Center. I'm standing on the roof of the blockhouse some 250 yards from the test stand. Beneath me, engineers are in the final countdown phase for the first static test of all five first stage engines on the Saturn V, the rocket that will someday carry astronauts to the moon. This enormous part of the rocket features five powerful F-1 engines and today, April 16th, 1965, for the first time, if all goes well, all five will fire together. This facility here in Huntsville has been the nerve center of the race to test the rockets that will fly the first humans to the moon. Werner von Braun and his team, along with engineers from Rocketdyne, have been designing and testing the F-1 engine for years, trying to solve the problems caused by scaling up to such a huge and powerful engine. Getting to this point has not been easy. Violent vibrations caused by the igniting fuel, what engineers call combustion instability or chugging, have been a nagging problem for the F-1. During many tests, these vibrations have literally ripped apart the engine, setting the program back. But now, in order to meet President Kennedy's deadline, it has been decided to test all five together, two months ahead of schedule. A failure during this test could end our hopes of getting to the moon by the end of this decade. Attention all personnel. Attention all personnel. Clear the test stand area. Clear the test stand area. Looks like the test conductor, Robert Sadler, has checked with his guys on their console to confirm all systems are go. We are about to witness history in the making. The F-1 was a large rocket engine designed by Rocketdyne and was used on the Saturn V launch vehicle, the same vehicle that took humans to the moon in the 1960s and early 70s. The F-1 was the most powerful single nozzle liquid fuel engine ever produced and created 6,770 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level, with a specific impulse of 304 seconds. The engine used a gas generator cycle where a small portion of the fuel and oxidizer are combined in a pre-burner. The high pressure gas created in this pre-burner was used to power the turbo pumps. In many gas generator cycle engines, the turbine exhaust is dumped outside of the engine, but on the F1 this exhaust, which was relatively cool compared to the exhaust from the main combustion chamber, was fed into the nozzle of the engine. This formed a boundary layer between the nozzle and the extremely hot exhaust from the main combustion chamber, which helped to keep the engine bell from overheating. The turbo pumps on the F-1 were extremely large, utilizing 55,000 horsepower to pump over 150,000 liters of liquid propellant into the engine per minute. The F-1 burned kerosene and liquid oxygen. This combination is less efficient than the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen combination used on the Saturn V's second and third stages, but has a much higher energy density. 
During development, the F1 was often affected by combustion instability, which induced oscillations and sometimes caused the engine to fail. To diagnose this problem, engineers used small amounts of explosives to cancel out the oscillations. Usually these explosives were C4 or black powder. Using these bombs to cancel out the oscillations allowed engineers to solve many of the problems causing the instabilities. After these fixes, the engine was very stable and was even able to self-dampen artificially induced instabilities. A total of 65 F1 engines flew on Saturn V launches. All of these engines ended up at the bottom of the Atlantic after the Saturn V first stage was ditched on the way to orbit. Some parts of these engines have been recovered by a team created by Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon Blue Origin. There were more recent plans to revive the F1 as part of Space Launch System. This uprated version would be known as the F1B and produce about 8,000 kilonewtons of thrust. During F1B development, an original F1 engine was taken out of a museum, refurbished, and tested. These engines would not be used on the core booster of Space Launch System, but instead would be part of the side boosters. This configuration of SLS would have been able to lift about 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Engineers have instead decided to use solid fuel boosters derived from the space shuttle boosters on SLS, and development of the F1B has been stopped. So it seems like the F1 will stay in retirement for now. Now, an interesting satellite with all its very sophisticated equipment to protect the hold down arms, there are four hold down arms that hold the vehicle in place when it starts. But as it lifts off, it's subject to the flames from the engine. So to protect them, there was a shield. There was a quarter inch rope that was tied from the bottom of the S1C to the shield, and as the vehicle lifted off, it slowly brought the shield up and covered the hold on arms until it broke. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, with all the sophistication, you know, a quarter inch rope worked fine. Uh, okay, and uh, the we've we've talked a lot about the F1 engine, uh, which was five of them there on the S1C stage. As you well know, we had one of the uh, the designers of that and manufacturers of Rocketdyne. We've got a couple of the Rocketdyne down here. A good friend, Ham Smith, is here. Ham, stand up a minute. And also, uh, there's another Rocketdyne guy sitting in the back. So we're. <laughs> This was one of the uh, one of the finest contractors that NASA had, along with many many of the contractors were outstanding for NASA. But uh, anyway, this I'll go over this very quickly. Uh, this was first developed at a million pounds of thrust, and then we went to one and a half million pounds of thrust. And uh, these are the ISP, but uh, that's probably technically we don't need to get into that because uh, we. Uh, Propulsion people would probably uh, snow you about uh, uh, what that means. Next chart. Uh, Dave Allridge, who is the program manager, this is out at Rocketdyne uh, in building uh, uh, one of the rocket engines. Okay. And this is in manufacturing. Next chart. These, uh, this was the largest rocket engine ever built in the world. Uh, the Russians never built anything like this. One of the greatest engineering feats in history. The pumps could pump enough water an Olympic uh, pool in a few seconds. It burned more fuel in one second than the Lindbergh used to cross the Atlantic. In uh, flight profile is similar to the new space launch vehicle. Rocketdyne, I mean, rocket went from paper design in six years, which is a phenomenal uh, achievement. The VAB down at the KSC uh, Cape is, was built to house that uh, Saturn vehicle. The building used by shuttle missions from 1981 to 2001, uh, even with the SLS Rocketdyne, that RS-25 is a is the new vehicle that's fixed to be launched next year hopefully, and go to the moon in 2024. 
Uh, we had 10 uh, very successful missions with on the F-1 engine with remarkable safety, as Mike has said. We launched the Skylab space station and uh, Saturn V uh, there. Uh, next chart. Okay, Bob Richmond uh, will actually talk the, uh, the, one of the major problems we had on the F-1 engine. And hopefully uh, this will not be so technical that it snows you, but uh, Bob will promise me that in 10 minutes he'll get the message across is what the problem we had. Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> now on the right you see there's the F1 engine. One and a half million pounds, one and a half million pounds of thrust. It operates on liquid oxygen and RP1 fuel, which is a blend of kerosene. It was, it was uh, developed by the Rocketdyne Company in Canoga Park, California. Okay, the next chart. Okay, I want you to see what, a, what we really mean by a thrust chamber. It, it, a, liquid, a typical liquid rocket propulsion chamber uh, consists of three main elements, an injector up at the front end and admitting the, the, the propellants into the combustion chamber, a cylindrical section where the reaction occurs, and then a, a nozzle that, that converts the heat that's released in the reaction to kinetic energy producing, producing the thrust. Now, when combustion instability occurs, it's usually right up at the front of the engine there in the combustion zone where most of the propellants are consumed. Yes, and, and it, uh, the frequencies vary from, can vary from, uh, from hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of cycles per second to thousands, cycles per to thousands of cycles per second, and it's uh, depending upon the, uh, the uh, configuration, the dimensions of the chamber, and the speed of sound in the medium. Now, instability can be thought of as, as these, like if you go to the beach and you see these, pressure, these waves coming into the, into the beach, lapping at the beach, of course they're at very low frequencies and not, so, not too high in amplitude, but instability is the same idea but it's very high amplitude and very high frequencies. These, <clears throat> uh, the other the, the instability also seems to be more prevalent with uh, RP-1 or, or kerosene type engines rather than other propellants such as liquid hydrogen, for, for example. And the causes are really not well understood. The triggering mechanisms are not, are not, are not well understood. Now, on this next chart, we're going to talk about what the consequences of instability, and let's have the, have the next chart. Uh, okay, this is the uh, typical cooling system for a liquid rocket engine. This is a regenerative system, and it's, the chamber walls have to be cooled, and they're cooled with the fuel that's, going to, that's flowing into the engine through, through coolant passages and uh, before it's admitted into the injector and into the, into the chamber. Now in normal operation, the heat load to the walls is balanced by the heat extraction by the, of the fuel taking the heat away. But when it becomes unstable, these high amplitude waves at such high frequencies impinge on the walls so rapidly, the walls are overheated very, very quickly and uh, the, the material gets overheated and gets weak and finally the pressures on the from the coolant pass in, inside the coolant passages push through the walls causing a breach in the chamber fuel flows into the thing from all directions and uh, it's starving the rest of the injector and so forth for the cooling that it needs and pretty soon the oxygen starts to react with the metal in the uh, in the injector and so on and the whole thing just burns up and uh, this was such a severe problem that, that, the, uh, that the, the uh, F-1 development schedule and President Kennedy's commitment to land on the moon and return in the, uh, before the decades of the 60s was, out, was, was really threatened. So something really, <coughs> really, really, really had to be done here. So, oh, next chart, please. Uh, what I want to say is here is that the, the, uh, the F-1 program was plagued early with combustion instability. And this was treated right at the beginning 
uh, as one of the routine problems, sort of a routine problem, that has to be overcome in the development of any new rocket system. But this, this, this uh, approach came to an end in June of 1962, almost exactly uh, 57 years ago, with the loss of a test engine on the test facility at Rocketdyne. And this uh, got, a, got the immediate attention of the company senior management and, and NASA ma senior management all the way up to NASA headquarters in Washington where, where concerns were beginning to develop about meeting the development schedule. So clearly, clearly something had to be done. The contractor uh, uh, formed a committee of senior combustion device experts that, that reported directly to the company the company president. NASA formed an ad hoc committee of, of uh, combustion specialists from the Lewis Research Center, Princeton University, Purdue University, and, and from uh, Aerojet General, a competitor that was asked to, to participate, and they responded by assigning one of their key uh, combustion researchers to the, to the uh, committee. Uh, the goal of the ad hoc committee was, was, was to uh, uh, apply combustion theory to the, to the problem, a, a assist in developing and in, in, in analyzing test results, uh, providing uh, uh, recommendations, and, in, and performing oversight of the work. Now, the goal was to come up with a dynamically stable system. By that, we mean one that if the system is perturbed with some kind of a disturbance, maybe we didn't really understand or know where it exactly came from or how it developed, but the system would, would, would damp itself out before any damage occurred and the, and the uh, combustor would keep on operating. So we, from earlier tests, there was a possibility that we could develop something like this. Now, to begin with, there, uh, there had to be cer certain uh, restrictions were placed on the program. And one, one is that we could not vary the, the, the dimensions or the configuration of the thrust chamber. That had been set early in the program, and there was no way to make any changes to that uh, and still meet the development schedule. So uh, work began, and combustion theory was applied. Uh, explosive charges were mounted inside the chamber to check to induce instability to see how the engine would, would, would respond. Uh, orifice, orifice diameters and uh, compingement angles were varied. And baffles, which, were, which, were, which had been used earlier in the program with mixed results, it was decided to retain the baffles. These were three inch long veins that extended from the injector face into the combustion zone with the idea of disrupting any type of organized frequencies that might try to develop. Uh, so finally, with uh, uh, <coughs> repeated testing and changing of the, uh, the uh, orifice, orifice sizes and uh, impingement angles, uh, finally an injector of, uh, emerged in 1965 that appeared to meet all the stability requirements that we were looking for. And, in, in, in the, and after that, exhaustive tests were made on the injector. Let's, let's look at the injector next charge. Uh, the <coughs> exhaustive tests were made on this in, uh, using this injector. It consisted of 13 baffle compartments and alternating uh, rings of fuel and oxidizer, each ring containing multiple pairs of impinging jets. And uh, so that's, uh, uh, that, that, that was what we, we came up with and it seemed to, and it, and it, and it, and it did the job. There were, there were no problems with any of the uh, uh, explosive charges that were ran during those tests. And so then in 1967, about that period, we, it was declared that this problem was over was solved, and in 1968, as you know, Apollo 8, uh, <coughs> Rondi uh, circled the moon and returned, and six months later, in 1969, in July the 16th, Apollo 11 was launched, 
with the crew that landed on the moon and returned safely. And, and President Kennedy's commitment was fulfilled. And, now that's what I witnessed and that's what I understood. And now there's one more, there's one video here made by the contractor, Rocketdyne, that's going to give their views on what, on what this program uh, was like. The first test objective was to attain a stable combustion using a solid wall thrust chamber and a flat face injector. The first test was held on Bravo 1A at the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. The maximum thrust level for the test stand was limited to one million pounds. One of the biggest challenges in the F-1 program was uh, solving a combustion stability problem we had. That was a, a major technical issue. It took a lot of time and effort uh, to resolve and was uh, critical to uh, continuing on with the program. And uh, fortunately, we were able to do that and the engine was proven to be very dynamically stable. Part of the resolution of the combustion stability issue, uh, numerous injector configurations were tried. Some of them were kind of uh, unique and uh, interesting and humorous in some cases. There was one that I recall was called an organ pipe uh, configuration made up of a series of uh, concentric tubes of all different lengths. And out of all of that, fortunately, uh, came the final design, which uh, was a baffled injector and uh, performed very well. Actually, it's pretty good for an old, uh, old professor there. Uh, Bob was in there and covered that. Uh, did a good job. Okay, Lynn, you, need the, you got the mic. Okay. I got the mic. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do, you've heard the stories about the uh, uh, engines. We call this thing propulsion, and uh, propulsion is more than an engine. Propulsion is those things that gives us thrust, but then you got to have all the things. You got to get the temperatures right. You got to get the pressures right. You get, got to be compatible with the vehicle that you put them into in order to get to a propulsion system. And this kind of is a story is kind of like Paul Harvey. For those of you who are old enough to remember Paul Harvey, uh, Paul Harvey, as he got towards the end, had a little different tale, and it was called The Rest of the Story. And so today, uh, this is uh, the integration of the propulsion issues during the uh, Apollo area is the rest of the story. Uh, actually, uh, uh, NASA became aware of a problem that uh, was unique to uh, large boosters, and it was a longitudinal oscillation of a vehicle that caused the vehicle to uh, move up and down, similar to the pogo stick that the kid would have, and you know, he playing in the in the yard. And this was a threat to uh, the Apollo program, and we found out about it actually uh, because of the issues associated with the uh, Gemini Titan II program. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, there was, uh, Gemini uh, was going to fly on a Titan II. Uh, the Titan II had a uh, longitudinal instability that created an acceleration load that was uh, probably okay for hardware, but was not okay for the crew. So NASA lived a requirement uh, in 1961 on the Gemini Titan program that the maximum oscillation would be plus or minus a quarter of a G at 11 hertz. When you get over about a quarter of a G uh, at 11 hertz, for an astronaut, his eyes get blurry as they're bounced around. If you get any stronger than that, generally his rib cage vibrates and it's somewhat uncomfortable and he limits his capability to fly the vehicle and to pull any uh, thing that he might have to uh, do. This is an instability. It occurs with a 
coalescing or crossing of a propulsion system with a structure system. Now, this, the way I'm defining propulsion system, that's everything that goes from the tank bottom through the nozzle exit. And then the structure is all that stuff that we hang that uh, engine and the rest of the payload to. And uh, so what we really have is a instability problem. The people at uh, Martin Marietta, who was the prime contractor for the Titan Gemini 2, they put out a multi-year effort to meet, primarily to meet our requirements for the crew. Uh, it found out that we found out actually about it uh, in uh, 1963. And we found about it by doing uh, a great amount of research. We actually read Aviation Week. And in Aviation Week, they had the story of the uh, N11 uh, Titan II that had shut itself off because of uh, oscillations and got uh, too high. We hot-footed uh, it out to uh, Denver and uh, sat down with the uh, people at uh, Martin Marietta, Martin Marietta, I think it was before they Marietta, they just Martin at that time. Uh, but it turns out that they were very uh, generous. They were continuing to work their problem. And so we began to work a similar problem with the potential of a uh, Apollo program, since our configurations was very similar to what uh, they uh, had from a configuration standpoint. From a hardware standpoint, the uh, hardware was a great deal of difference. The propellants that they were using were different from our LOX and RP. And it turns out, though, that they were able to share with us how they were doing their analysis. They, uh, told us how they were setting up to get the input data to go into the propulsion analyses. And we actually put them under contract and they began to come to Huntsville. We began to go to Martin and uh, put together a, a stability model that would be applicable to Apollo. As the uh, emphasis on this area uh, increased and as the schedule got closer uh, to uh, the end of the decade, uh, this became a big issue. Uh, we formed a working group that included uh, NASA and industry and most of the people within the industry, Martin, Boeing, uh, uh, I guess the McDonnell Douglas was there, North American, uh, airspace was uh, in there and it was a big organization, and everybody concludes uh, you can't uh, establish uh, the stability margin on the ground. And the reason for that is that the uh, vehicle is held down, and when you hold it down, then you sort short circuit the uh, coupling between the feed system and the flight uh, and the structure. So this is a flight problem. But we uh, had to make predictions for it, so we made predictions for it with our stability model. Uh, we had a good, good deal of confidence in the stability model, but we didn't have all that confidence in the uh, input data from the propulsion system. Running uh, parameter studies, we found out that the uh, stability margin was very sensitive to the input. But as we were pushing up towards the first man uh, flight, uh, we had to predict the uh, margin of, uh, for stability, and uh, we actually had were predicting a, a small margin. And we carried this down to the uh, L minus two day review. Two days before the launch, uh, all the management and all the vehicle systems people come together to decide whether or not they're ready to fly. We left Huntsville and on the, uh, on the Gulf Stream, uh, Von Braun uh, liked to take off, so he was taken off. And as soon as he got uh, up and leveled off, he came back and took his seat on the right-hand uh, back seat as a senior passenger and asked 
let me see your charts. And so he goes and flips through all the charts that's making uh, various issues that we're going to address at level uh, two. And it turns out that when he came to the stability chart, he said, this will never fly. And he said that we couldn't get that, couldn't sell that. So what we really had is we had a curve that showed a stability as a function of flight time. We had large margins at early in the burn. At about 120, 130 seconds, we were showing minimum stability margin. And uh, uh, Von Braun said that'll never work. So he said, uh, when we get on the ground, I will filibuster the meeting for 30 minutes and said, somebody go and take this chart and crosshatch the area under our curve, and we will argue that this is the area that we are operating in, and the line there is just the worst case. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we made the changes to the chart, slipped it into the presentation. I think Bob Marshall was making the uh, presentation that day, and when he came to that chart, everything hit the fan. Everybody wanted to talk at the same time, and they uh, shut the meeting down, got off to, in uh, side groups and began to work the problem. Turns out that uh, uh, the, uh, Dr. Miller, who was the head of the uh, technical guy, I guess, chief technical guy on the Apollo program, uh, he said, I want to see all the data that goes into the analysis. I want to see the propulsion data. And said, who's got that? I told him, well, I thought I had that. And he said, well, I want to see it. So I brought it in, showed him the data. Turns out that uh, uh, it was a plot of uh, amplitude versus uh, frequency. And he said, well, where do you think residence is? And I thought the chart was clear. I told him it was right here, right in the middle of the uh, chart there. And uh, that's what we used in analysis. And he said, well, you know, I said, I really don't think it's there. He said, I think it's over here. And he moved it over about a half a hertz. And when he did that, he said, now go back and have all the cases rerun tonight. And I'll look at the data in the morning.
three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have liftoff at two thirteen.